whilst we wait for the last minute, as usual, I'll run past who we have joining us again today. Welcome to our Australian guests. We have most of our guests in from Australia, New Zealand. We've got a strong repertoire for New Zealand, so welcome, New Zealand. USA, welcome to our United States brothers and sisters. Japan, we have a strong group of people from Japan, so welcome, Japan. We love you. China, welcome to our Chinese brothers and sisters. Malaysia, hi, Malaysia. Singapore, hi, Singapore. We do have a new group today joining us from Cambodia. So welcome, Cambodia. It's great to have you on board. And of course, our brothers and sisters from Canada, we always love you joining in as well. Uh, before we get started, I'd also like to welcome and introduce to you our customer support team as usual. We have Karen Rodriguez. Hi everybody, welcome. Melissa Rapper. Hi everyone. And Whitney Hankins. Hi everyone. As your client relationship managers, if you need Melissa, Karen or I, we're here to support you, so just give us a call. Thanks, Whit. And I'd like to introduce everyone today to Brendan Gray. Brendan is Head of Implants across our Australia and New Zealand facilities. Brendan, say hello. Hello, everybody. Basically, I'm here to deal with any of your implant cases, so feel free to call, email, and I'll work with you closely to give you the best result possible. All right. Thanks, Brennan. We appreciate your knowledge. It's uh, definitely second to none. Just going to screen share now, so excuse one moment while we get started. Okay, so today we talk about the experts tips and tricks to get better results for restorative manufacture. Uh, so, yeah, we had a lot of requests for this topic, um, how to do different things, and I'm going to talk today predominantly about a number of different topics. But um, what I'm going to talk about today is uh, my opinion, the way this lab does things, but in no way, shape or form is it the only way to do things. There's many ways to skin a cat. Um, we have found a way that's been successful over 84 years this laboratory has been servicing. Um, but I guess please keep in mind that just because one person's opinion may work, it doesn't mean another person's opinion could be wrong. And I really like this slide that outlines two ways of looking at the same issue. To one at six, the other it's nine. So just try and stay open-minded that there are more ways to do things. But the way I'm going to explain today has been working for us, our clinicians, and the way Brendan and I have been marching forward with our restorative manufacture. What's on the agenda today? Predominantly screw retained versus cement retained restorations. When and how to pick what and why. Correct placement of, of hardware and how to use x-rays to ensure you get good results like that. By actual screw placement, which has really become a popular topic in today's restorative manufacture. Um, our most popular topic today will be healing abutments and how customising the results can give premium results and what the experts do to, to, uh, to get those results by using customised healing abutments. And then duplicating that in your impression taking technique, I think, uh, is another important component. We will be dealing with both digital impressions and traditional impressions uh, for these topics. So don't panic if you have digitised your front end, that's fine. If you haven't, uh, that's fine too. We're going to cover both sides of the coin. So cement retain using a customised abutment, preferably, and a cement retain crown or a screw retain restoration with a screw in it, um, as pictured here on the right-hand side, lettered B. What do we look for when we make our decision, screw retain versus cement retained? Ideally, retrievability has most predominantly been the biggest selling point for a screw retain restoration. Should we need to retrieve the restoration, it's very important to have one that we can, uh, that allows that to happen. Aesthetics comes in a pretty close second. There's no doubt um, it's, it's super important to enable uh, the aesthetics of the restoration uh, to, be, to be maintained. Um, it needs to be easy to manufacture and easy to place. And I think um, simplifying the workflows uh, with biaxial screw access uh, and those sorts, and the, today's industrial milling technology has really enabled us to, to make the delivery of the restoration uh, a lot more simple. The cost, this always must come into it, predominantly or, or especially in today's economic environment, 
Um, people are shopping around. We have uh, a lot of pressure to uh, compete, so cost really does need to uh, to come into it. Something that's super important to me is hygiene. We need to ensure the patient can keep it clean. Aesthetics and function are paramount, but hygiene runs a very close third. So we'll need to keep that in mind today. Longevity, make sure the restoration will last, hopefully as long as we promise the patient it can. And strength, and I think that has a lot to do with uh, the longevity as well. So these are the topics we're going to touch on. We're going to see what, what restoration best suits uh, for all of these topics. So cement retain restoration and screw retain restoration. Retrievability for screw retain is no doubt is the number one factor. If something does happen, we can remove the composite, remove the restoration and replace it very simply. We're not having to cut off or, or, or risk further damage. But there's no doubt a cement restoration does have uh, a, a, an edge when it comes to aesthetic. There's simply no hole in the restoration. Uh, so that's important to a lot of clinicians. Hygiene, because it's probably pretty similar for both, but I really like uh, the screw retain restoration because there's no chance of cement being left in the, in the bonding site or the cementation site. And I think this is the main reason why screw retain crowns uh, are, on, are on the grow. Uh, are growing in popularity. Cost, this has definitely turned around years ago with traditional manufacture. The cost to manufacture a screw retained crown was far greater than the cost to manufacture a cement retained crown. But with today's latest um, industrial milling technology, we can see uh, that has really flipped around in entirety. Uh, and the cost of a screw retained crown is more efficient or effective than the, the more expensive cement retained counterpart. I think screw retained crowns are far easier to manufacture. We're just manufacturing one restoration with a bonded interface, where cement retained restoration, we're basically trying to manufacture two uh, and trying to keep the cement um, easy to bring out. Longevity wise, not sure that one would be better than the other. There is questions that they sometimes believe uh, with there's no hole in the occlusion in this area here, uh, that the longevity and the strength of the restoration may be better. Personally, I don't think it is. Maybe back in the wax cast and layered restoration years, that could have been the case. But today with superior products such as monolithic translucent zirconia, uh, I don't think that would play much of a role. So these are the things we look at and there's no doubt I think the trend is toward a screw retain restoration. Uh, we're definitely making more of those today. Should you choose a cement retain restoration, I think it's paramount to use a customised abutment and this will ensure that our cement can be easily removed. Um, cement and gingiva do not get on you can see the cement easily will come out here. We have a sub gingival restoration, or when we both, when we used to manufacture these restorations with prefabricated abutments, um, it was a nightmare for the clinician to get the cement out, and I think it became a big problem. With cement retained prosthesis, I hear a lot of people saying I use retraction cord, but packing retraction cord is ineffective in preventing sub gingival cement accumulations. Here's a study done back in 2011 saying cement has been showed to extrude apical to the retraction cord prior to cementation. So if you do use traction, retraction cord to combat the cement being packed subgingively, uh, a definitive negative result uh, will occur. And ideally, peri-implantitis, if the margin is subgingival, there will be residual cement 100% of the time. A study back in 2013 showed 100% of the time there will be some residual cement left in the cementation of bonding area. Pre-implantitis may then ensue, leading to loss of implants and often the adjacent teeth. A study done in 2009 and another in 2011, both showing that um, uh, the, the negative result to cement return restorations um, complements of the bond or cement not being able to be removed. And 80% of cases of very implantitis are secondary to subgingival cement accumulations. So I guess this is probably why we're seeing chronic growth of the screw retain restoration. Um, hygiene is paramount. So gingival hate cement, uh, get out of there and focus on um, the 
routine restoration. These sorts of results are pretty scary, uh, but I guess if you do have cement, this is what can happen. Again, just wanted to touch base when we do design our cement retained, it's super important that we do design the abutment sub gingival and aesthetic zone, equi gingival in the non aesthetic zone, and blanching can be uh, aesthetic but also enable the cement to be removed. So keep all this in mind. Here's a case that is done, that has been done properly. You can see a nice, nicely placed implant, and I think that's probably. Uh, a beautifully positioned implant. We can't always get those results. And you can see the hole that's been filled. It's a very aesthetic result. We still have the benefits of retrievability. Uh, and these days with angulated screw channel or bi-actual results, we can tackle um, these implants that aren't placed um, as favorably as what the technicians would like. Excuse me. And a case that's uh, not done properly, I think um, with today's materials, a good lab, and um, good industrial technology, these results uh, are history. So we can really focus on this result in the middle here. So here's, the, here's our slide showing the growth of screw retain restorations from 2013 up until 2019. And you can see the reasonably flat position of the cement retain restorations. And I just approached our data analysis team here at Race Dental Head Office uh, for this slide and it came in this morning, believe it or not. I just had time to add it to the presentation and it really shows the growth of screw retained restorations. And for these reasons, such as hygiene and retrievability, I think um, this is why the experts choose to do a screw retained restoration over and above uh, any of the others. Correct placement. Too often we see impressions taken with impression copings that haven't been placed correctly. So help us to help you. Uh, please provide us with the x-ray of the impression coping, um, even if it's done traditional impression coping or a digital impression coping, i.e. a scan body. Feel free to send the, uh, the x-ray in so we can be sure that the, the hardware has been placed correctly prior to the intraoral scan or traditional impression being taken. On the left hand side, you can see what it looks like or what you're looking for when uh, any hardware hasn't been placed correctly. And on the right hand side, uh, a new x-ray that's taken of the same case uh, after it has been placed. And we see a lot with these narrow platform trends uh, these days, the narrow platform um, trend of implant placement uh, and subcrestally and a lot of bone growth disallowing some of the hardware to be placed so please ensure your x-rays are, are done and sent to the lab so we can uh, work with you in ensuring that the restoration will seat accurately first time. So this patient presented with pre-implantitis three years after the restoration you can see the initial x-ray indicated that the crown may have been seated correctly but on the New x-ray, you can see that uh, the subsequent x-ray on the right-hand side shows the implant uh, and, the, and the hardware not placed correctly. So when you're assessing your x-rays, have a look at this curve here. This little curve here, when, when you take an x-ray perpendicular to the x-ray and the hardware itself, you should see a straight line of where the, the two hardwares meet. If I just remove those, you'll see the curve on the left, which definitively shows that the x-ray has not been taken perpendicular to the two parts of hardware, as opposed to the right-hand side that has been. So always looking for that curve and that straight line to show that a perpendicular x-ray has been taken. Only a perpendicular x-ray can truly show complete and proper placement of hardware. Keep it in mind. The importance of correct positioning, and this here is why radiologists want two views I love this example and it was sent to me by a uh, prosthodontist in Singapore and it made me laugh saying really uh, this is why radiologists do like two, two views because the results uh, can be outstandingly different so uh, keep that in mind. So how do we combat um, screw access placement uh, for implants that have been placed um, perfectly for osseointegration reasons but not so favorably for um, restorative purposes. And we, I think this uh, biaxial screw channel has been 
integral in the growth of the screw retain restoration. Um, now we can combat implant placement and restorative manufacture access screw access uh, by use of biaxial screws or angulated screw channel. Um, so these days we can realign uh, the access for the screw up to maybe 20 or 25 percent. I think that's probably a little too much personally uh, to, to get um, full torque on a implant screw at 25 degrees is maybe pushing the boundaries a little bit too much but 15 or 20 uh, is good if you do hit 25 i think that's time to start looking for a an alternative solution such as a, a cement retained restoration unfortunately corrections can't be done uh, too much i think this is a little bit too too aggressive in its um, in its promise but up to 20 degrees we can really start uh, realigning those access holes bringing the screw channels out in the cingulum areas or out in the occlusal fissure areas on posterior restorations and giving us uh, the results we need to give the patient both good osseointegration and uh, good aesthetically pleasing restorations that can be retrieved. Here's what it looks like. The driver you use must be a biaxial screw channel um, specific driver and the head is a round head which you can see going into the, into the hardware here. The only way a screw can be screwed on an angle is if you use a biaxial screw and a biaxial screw driver. So keep that in mind. It's paramount that you provide us with the information. You tell us you have the biaxial screw uh, driver that's needed, and if you don't, we're happy to send that out with your lab or uh, with the case or, or ask your lab to have that sent out. I think it's very paramount to do that. Um, these days, we do get asked. Uh, and push to push the boundaries aesthetically. A lot of patients want to sit up in a chair and have a mouthful of white. Uh, I think that's dangerous. I think as clinicians and technicians, we need to work together to ensure we give the patient an emergence profile that not only works aesthetically, but also works hygienically long-term. I think when we push the boundaries and overfill the black triangle, uh, we risk food trapping and, and, and long-term uh, alveolar resorption around these implants. And it's important that we don't allow the patients to dictate to our clinicians uh, the results. Um, obviously, the clinicians know what they're doing. They need to ensure that we get good emergence profile to enable good cleaning for long-term results. The longevity and hygiene is paramount to the success of implants long-term. Again, with the narrow platform prayers, um, for obvious reasons. There's a lot of benefits to that. Uh, we see healing abutments that are placed. If you do have a sub placed implant, it is super important that we use an implant system that has an internal connection and the color height of the hardware enables this hardware to be seated. So please feel free to um, measure that distance to the crestal height or crestal bone to enable the lab to choose the right hardware. Uh, the lab just simply cannot tell if the implant is subcrestal, equicrestal, or if it's a, a soft tissue or, or tissue level placed implant. Uh, please ensure you guide us to ensure we can deliver uh, a restoration at the a great example of a two unit case in one, two and two, two positions. Um, if I move to this picture here, you can simply see the implant here and a healing abutment that has been placed on top. And it can clearly see that the room left for the restorative manufacturer is insufficient. If I move across to the right hand side, where you can see the placement of the titanium interface, and you can clearly see there's, there's no room whatsoever left for Brendan and his team to be able to provide the restoration, even with sufficient blanching on the buckle. There's just no room to do this. And if we do restore it under the guidance of the dentist or request of the dentist, the results are, um, aren't good long term. So you can see here the cross section of an anterior tooth at the CEJ level. This is what that looks like, and the lateral, and the canine, etc. If an implant is placed and placed well in the correct position, you'll see it sitting around about here. 
just like that lateral I showed you a moment ago. Unfortunately, we need to create a tooth that's a lot larger than that emergence profile position of that implant. Here's a posterior tooth that came in digitally. You'll see here's the hole that they're healing abutment, the narrow platform healing abutment left. This is the cross section of the tooth that the laboratory has to make. And this is a big problem for us. This is what the restoration ends up looking like. And when we bond our titanium interface in on the bottom of this restoration, you can understand where our problem lies and it becomes fractured in this area here. So please help us help you. Use the largest healing abutment possible or even better, customise your healing abutments. Give the lab what it needs to give your patient what they need to get a good result. Use a healing abutment that mimics the diameter of the cross section of the natural tooth that's been manufactured, that we're replacing, should I say. Emergence profile needs to mimic the natural tooth at the CEJ level. Here's a prime example of what it should look like, a pretty much exact replica of the restoration we're matching. Give the laboratory these restorations, these impressions, these, this foundation, and we will get a nice, aesthetic, long-term result that will last and last. How do we do that? I believe customised healing abutments ensure a perfect soft tissue management. You can see here a healing abutment here with nice composite. This can be this composite. We have our clinicians that use Duralay. We have clinicians that have peak solutions or PEK solutions uh, in these areas. Uh, but you give this nice cross-sectional area to the lab and we'll ensure we give you a nice result back. Very, very helpful. Once you have a soft tissue that's healed correctly, we need to ensure we get a, the, that duplicated with customised uh, impression coping. This one, this photo shows a traditional impression coping placed and then composite pumped down into that region to ensure that we get, uh, the laboratory gets a complete duplication of the emergence of that, of that case. Here's another case sent in. Um, that you can see it doesn't need to be super pretty. On the right hand side, we've got a customized impression coping. And you can see the emergence of that customized impression coping on the lingual or the palatal, and emergence on the buckle or the label, labial, sorry, um, that marries exactly. So that we can ensure we give an exact replica of what has been created in the mouth. And the design over the top shows exactly the same result. It's screw retained or cement retained, it's designed together and fused to one uh, where we need to. So please uh, feel free to give us the results uh, that we need to give your patients what they need. Okay, we've got a couple of questions coming through. I might leave those to the end. We have Karen vetting the questions. So Karen, if you have any good questions there at the end, feel free to ask those. I'll, uh, I'll throw it over to you when we're done here. Thanks. Here's an excellent Case um, done by uh, Greg G. Uh, he's an awesome dentist, does some beautiful work. We have a, a case, um, and you don't need to provide us with the healing abutment. Greg actually pulls the healing, healing the customised healing abutment out and sinks it into some lab putty here on the left-hand side, lets it set, then puts it back in the mouth, sends the laboratory this lab putty. We then get a customised, or sorry, a, a titanium interface, pop it into... The, the lab putty and then Brennan and his team run some wax around this area here to create a duplicate of that. That's then placed in the model and used to manufacture a customised uh, tissue to, to duplicate the shape of the customised healing abutment. So these traditional impression workflows really create perfect results. We get a nice finish, we get nice emergence profile, we don't risk the restoration is going to fail long term and no fracture around a titanium interface. Looking at from the top, you clearly see now we have this beautiful emergence profile that clearly shows a cross section of the tooth that we're trying to manufacture. So these restorations and these impression techniques, um, no doubt, are the bit than what our experts are using to give us good results. Thank you, Greg. Um, digitally, we have some. Uh, 
even better or easier way as our clinicians are getting the results. This is the three-shaped case, um, courtesy of Dr. Anthony Mack. Uh, you can see a quick shade photo taken here. I think that's more that we need to take the photo. Um, the pre-preparation scan is taken with all of the um, mandibular restorative uh, teeth um, with the healing abutment still in, still in, in intact. Another scan is then taken immediately after the healing abutment has been removed. Prior, uh, that records the ginger prior to any, any, um, any collapse of the tissue. You pull it out, you take a quick scan, and you lock it before the, the healing, the, the gingiva collapses and you get a nice duplication digitally of the emergence profile of that customised healing abutment. Um, it's a really powerful way of doing that. Then a scan's taken. Here's a three-shaped scan body screwed into position. Um, Anthony takes beautiful photos, so thank you. Uh, the x-ray comes through of the uh, ensuring placement of the... Uh, scan body. I think that's paramount as well to show us that it has been placed correctly. Uh, the digital impression has been completed. Uh, obviously the opposing and the, the MMR or bite scan is taken as well and the restoration can be placed. Simple, effective, beautiful soft tissue management uh, first time every time. Um, here's another case Dr. Habibi uh, worked with us showing that um, on the left-hand side, the placement of the healing uh, of the, uh, sorry, the uh, impression coping. And you can see in the, here in the middle, the nice merging, emergence profile of the, of the healing abutments that, that uh, Mathagi uses. And on the right-hand side, the original healing abutments that we used. And here you can see uh, where we've cross-pollinated the narrow platform healing abutment as opposed to the the, the emergence of the uh, the nicer wider healing abutment uh, and the, the results are a lot nicer we can get a nice emergence profile guaranteed strength uh, and it really is an excellent uh, display of um, the importance of, of emergence profile uh, predominantly at healing at the healing stage so help us to help you um, the lab is governed by the impressions you, you send so please um, uh, practice these techniques, uh, learn from the experts, and the lab can help you. When we do place, we want zero uh, pressure, uh, mesially and distally, because there's no movement of the tissue. Um, so we will not give any blanching mesially and distally. We will not blanch palatally or lingually, or very rarely, uh, but we will blanch on the buckle or the labial uh, for aesthetic purposes. But it must be careful. If we have a very thin gingiva on the buckle or the labial here, and we place our implant, not only does it blanch the tissue, but it pushes the tissue downwards. So when we design our abutments, if you see we have um, the margin a little bit lower than, uh, than what you would normally like, it's probably because there's not a lot of ginger on the labial, and we're worried that not only will it push outwards, but it will push downwards as well. So just keep that in mind, especially for those of you that do still like customised titanium abutments. Uh, it's really important that you understand when Brendan and his team are designing these abutments, they're thinking about placing them uh, according to the, the thickness or the amount of gingiva. Uh, and so uh, keep that in mind when, when the case is coming. You can see a prime example when there's not a lot of ginger in this area. Not only does it push out, it pushes down and exposes the aesthetics. So again, uh, can, can consider using a customised titanium abutment. Uh, we have a lot of questions coming in now, Karen. I'll just get you to hold on those again. Uh, we're nearly done here. Here's a case done by Dr. Stuart Dean, um, max, oral and maxillofacial surgeon. Um, here's the shade photo that was taken. He then do an initial scan of the healing abutment um, and get all of the, the natural dentition in and around the area. We then remove the healing abutment and take a quick scan of the emergence profile of the restoration uh, of the healing abutment uh, that has been left, lock it in, uh, and then place the scan body for the acquisition or the digital intraoral scan. That scan's taken. It's a little bit hard to see here. There's a flat edge on this scan body here, and this flat edge here is all the detail that outlines the depth angulation and rotation of that implant in a sub-gingival position. 
So now we have all that information that's subgingival now amplified super occlusally to enable us to know exact rotation, depth and angulation of that implant. And this is where digital impressions shine. That comes to the lab. A crown is autonomously positioned. We make any adjustments we feel necessary. We then cross-section that restoration on a number of cuts to ensure our emergence profile is correct and the blanching is correct where we need or want it. And then the crown is completed and the restoration of the model is, uh, is completed after that and they meet up. And you'll see these sorts of fits can only really be um, done using digital technology. The occlusions double check, interdigitated with the opposing occlusion and uh, through articulation, and the case is sent back for placement. This is a an opalite restoration, um, so we're going for strength. I think it looks pretty good. Uh, the bite is then checked, and this is what we were talking about before in this area here. Don't fill the black triangle in too much. I really enjoy working for the oral and maxillofacial facial surgeon, Stuart Dean obviously gave me the details of how deep the crestal bone was. So I knew how high to make my contact area, complements of the Tarnow rule. And over time, you can see the growth of that gingiva covering the, black, the blackness or grayness of the implant here. And also growing up and filling these black triangles. And I think this restoration will look so much nicer with the gingiva growed back, grown back up into the... Um, uh, papillary areas, um, there's no doubt when we get it right. We work professionally as clinicians and technicians, uh, we can get these sorts of results. Compliment of, uh, of Dennis Tarnow and his iconic study who produced the five millimeter rule, stating that when the distance from the contact point to the proximal osseous crest is five millimeters or less, there is complete fill of the gingival embrasures with an interdental papilla. And I really, really love his studies. I was reading his studies recently in the Compendium of Continuing Education in Dentistry, and he also quoted that one of the biggest hurdles of restorative dentists still need to overcome is the realisation that intraoral scanning of crowns and dental implants is now just as accurate, faster, and in the long run, less costly than traditional impression techniques. Uh, and I think he's come a long way, and this is why we, we've far surpassed the the critical inflection point where more of our impressions for crown bridge and implants are being received through intraoral scanners than are through traditional te um, techniques. So here's a case um, when we do get it right, here's courtesy of Dr. Michael Tan. Uh, when the case goes in, um, we really enjoy the aesthetics uh, and function, and our patients can walk away knowing not only is the aesthetics correct, not only will this crown function correctly, but the soft tissue management, and we all know that the soft tissue is the issue, uh, we can be sure that we can deliver uh, good results first time, every time, and it really makes restorative manufacture and clinical implant dentistry uh, exciting. Um, come a long way and I, I, I thoroughly have enjoyed it. So um, I guess that re leads us to the end of our uh, half an hour. I'm three minutes overdue. Karen, I did see a number of uh, questions coming through. Would you be able to um, maybe light one or two of those up? Uh, yep, yeah, I can see that there is one particular question here from Dr. Taylor just um, asking about implant brands. Can Race Dental restore most implant brands? Um, that's an awesome question, uh, and it's probably a huge question that you need to, or clinicians need to ask when embarking predominantly on a digital journey. Um, the implant scan body must marry with the implant libraries that the laboratory use or have. Um, so Race Dental currently use, uh, can manufacture on every implant currently available in Australia and New Zealand. And we also have another bunch of systems available in Singapore, uh, Hong Kong, and Malaysia. Um, but if you're working, if that question's come in from Australia and New Zealand, you can rest assured uh, that we can service any implant brand that's being currently used. If it's come in from any of the other countries, I do ask that you contact our customer support team just to ensure we do cover uh, any of those implant brands as well. Great. Thanks, Matthew. 
And um, I just have a, another question here from Dr. Wong, just regarding um, designing of implant cases. Is that something that we can, uh, dentists can communicate with Brendan about um, and um, work with the implant team to design cases, particularly for those aesthetic cases that uh, need to be, to, to be done? Um, look, Alvin, oh, if, if, uh, Dr. Wong, it, it's, a, it's an excellent question and we do encourage and highly encourage um, case planning to be done both technically and clinically. Um, we do pick up things that we can help. Uh, material science uh, is another strong point uh, uh, that, our, that the lab um, understands. So by all means, contact the lab. Uh, Brendan's knowledge is probably second to none in the technical realm for Australia. So uh, feel free to contact us anytime. We do like to be involved in case planning because sometimes we might pick up something that might simplify the workflow or a material that may make the case work better. Fantastic. Thank you, Matt. All right. I just wanted to say thanks again. If you do need anything, feel free to contact uh, Race. Uh, our customer support team are here to support you. Brendan's a wealth of knowledge, so feel free to lean on him. Uh, I know I do, and thank you, Brendan. I appreciate your time. Pleasure. Thanks for having me. No problem at all, guys. Look, thanks again. If there's anything you need, contact Race Dental or make contact through www.racedental.com.au. Appreciate everyone's time. I hope to see you all again soon.